Oh. So to start off, and this is always the most painful part of interviews for me, <laughs> um, but if you're able to just like mm -hmm. introduce yourself, mm -hmm. like who you are, mm -hmm. and if you can um, just give a, like, a, I don't know, just a really brief introduction to your work in a way mm -hmm. that you would with someone who, who knows nothing about mm -hmm. anything that you do. Greetings, I'm Audrey Tom, a human being. Um, I'm usually called a open source civic hacker. Uh, open source meaning that I relinquish all my copyright to all my work so that people can take my work and do whatever they want with it. Civic just means that I care a lot about the society and people that I know and people I don't know and maybe not just people and the how ecology and animals and plants. And uh, hacker means that I uh, use interesting creative ways to solve existing problems instead of trying to use existing tools to solve new problems which never works and so it may or may not be illegal but that's not the topic uh, of this particular interview and uh, I'm 34 years old and have been retired for a couple of years and focusing on the voluntary sector and mostly based in Taiwan but I spent two months a year in Europe that's pretty much about me um, I'm really. In, I think the the audience that we're um, that we're speaking to will be really interested in Gub Zero mm -hmm. in particular. Sure. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just sort of like giving a, a brief explanation of mm -hmm. maybe of sort of what Gub Zero is mm -hmm. and where it came from and. Mm -hmm. the, the projects that you're, mm -hmm. and if, if you want, just sort of the, the stuff that you've done and the mm -hmm. stuff that you're sort of focused on, mm -hmm. just really conveying the, mm -hmm. the underlying purpose and mission. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, Gov Zero started three years ago, uh, and um, it was started by four hackers. Uh, not me, I joined about two months after its uh, in initiation. And it starts with a very simple vision. It's called forking the government. And in uh, computer science, uh, in especially open source collaboration, to fork something means to take something as it was, but take it to a different direction. And if the original, what we call upstream, uh, agrees with those modifications, they can merge it back at any time because people uh, relinquish their copyright in exactly the way the upstreams did. So to fork something means that you agree with whatever it, it exists, but you don't agree with how it's going, where it's going, and then you take it to a different direction. So to fork a government means, very simply, that there is a domain name called g0v.tw and so uh, for any the Taiwan government agencies for example the legislative would be ly.gov.tw and if you change the o to a zero in your browser um, then and you click enter then you get into the gov0 version of the parliament and which shows all the proposals, all the bills with a visual differences before and after and like a flow chart uh, where each bill is going and in all a very open data, uh, structured data kind of way. <coughs> and there's the initial uh, project was about budget, the national budget, which was a, in PDFs, in Word files, <coughs> and they uh, did it in a very visual, very dynamic kind of way, so everybody could not only understand where each of the budget items is going, but can actually click on them and engage in a conversation uh, around that particular budget. And afterwards, uh, there were many, many other projects because it's really just a space with uh, mostly hackathons and with online meeting places. So anyone who want to fork a particular government function went ahead and did it. And so people did that for uh, ballot, for the uh, environment, uh, for the uh, all sort of uh, dictionaries, the Ministry of Education, of Agriculture, and so on. So there's like shadow versions of each governmental functions in the Gov Zero domain name. And the amazing thing is, uh, in the past year, uh, the local as well as the national government has been merging back our contributions so that a lot of the so-called fork diversions uh, that Gov Zero did as proof of concepts are now being merged back, for example, in the Taipei city and in many different uh, city governments as the standard way of their communication with the public. And so this is a very interesting government-to-government -government kind of 
<laughs> Wait, so we, we kind of act as the research division, uh, internet research division for the existing government. That's the uh, governmental view of that theory. Yeah. And what was the what was the initial impetus for starting Gov Zero? Right. So there was this uh, advertisement uh, that was, I think, one of the first YouTube uh, advertisements that the administration did three years ago. It's about the so-called economic boosting plan, and the entire advertisement uh, has just a single message in that the national budget and how they allocate it for the economy are too complex to understand. We don't expect the citizen to understand it, but we do have a plan, so just shut up and follow the plan. And it's kind of insulting. Uh, and so people flagged it as spam on YouTube, and so the administrative account was just uh, suspended. I think it's also world's best, <coughs> not not a very honorary one at that. And so, but it's I mean, it just takes one email back to YouTube for them to restore it. But but the problem, of course, is not about flagging it as spam, it doesn't do anybody any good. Um, the problem is the, the mindset that the government thinks they're so specialized and the citizens so ignorant that it's impossible to convey this amount of information. And so the initial founder of GovZero thought, you know, maybe the problem is not that the budget is too complex. The problem is that the paper-based tools, the PDFs that they're using are just not the correct vehicle for communication. So they used D3JS, they used a lot of tree mapping, a lot of visualization. And by visualization in computer science, we mean to turn raw materials into something that people can because we are so good at pattern recognition, at recognizing colors, the different shapes, the relative area, amount, amount of shapes, and so on. So if you use the correct charts, the correct graphs to represent information, people actually can get a very good intuitive understanding uh, about budgets in a matter of minutes instead of hours or days if you want to uh, read the original raw material. But we still cross-reference back to the original raw material to ensure the kind of objectivity that the, of the kind of work we're doing. So this is a way to save everybody's cognitive cost and only after that can people really engage in meaningful or public conversation. Wow, that is so good. I didn't realize the, that the video had been marked as spam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can imagine the inside government reaction to something like that yeah. happening. Um, the the relationship between GovZero and mm -hmm. the um, Sunflower Movement, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm specifically thinking, like, the, the Sunflower Movement got, like, no coverage, no mainstream media mm -hmm. coverage in New Zealand at yeah. all, like, mm -hmm. zero, zero coverage. Mm -hmm. um, if you'd be able to, like, just sort of give a, um, sure. a brief, <gasps> I don't know, an account of, of sort of what happened at sure. the beginning of last year, like what the root causes were and what unfolded. Sure. The Sunflower Movement um, is, very plainly speaking, a bunch of people, mostly students, occupied the parliament for 22 days. Um, and it's part of the global wave of the Occupy movements except it's kind of high profile, the parliament is a very high profile place. And the people, when they occupy a parliament, they did something that other occupy movements tend not to do. They did deliberation. They did what legislators are supposed to do um, from within the government, uh, within the parliament, and they demonstrated with a uh, live streamed kind of way what kind of deliberative democracy could work in highly contentious divisive issues like the cross-strait trade agreement. The cross-strait tr trade agreement is a set of agreements that China wants to sign with Taiwan to allow services and investment to flow both ways. And usually, when Taiwan wants to sign any such trade agreement, which is very popular nowadays, uh, with other uh, countries like New Zealand, uh, the parliament does get a say. The parliament can review the um, the terms, they can veto the terms, they can go back to administration demanding a renegotiation, you know just what the parliament is supposed to do. But for China-Taiwan uh, agreements, because constitutionally Taiwan thinks China is part of Taiwan, and China thinks Taiwan is part of China, um, so they sound alike, but very different actually. Uh, 
So there's a lot of constitutional problems because then it's not, strictly speaking, a foreign agreement. Uh, and so in this case, at that time, there's no way for the parliament to get any meaningful receipt of any trade agreement between Taiwan and China. It's just the president and the administrative branch signing anything, and the parliament doesn't have a say, doesn't have a veto right on it. <coughs> and this is clearly, um, if it's constitutionally okay, it's clearly against the constitutional ideas of most people in Taiwan. So people, when they're without a recourse uh, in the constitutional legal sort of way, they resorted finally uh, to, to occupation. So basically by the day where it took just 30 seconds for the parliament says, okay, we have no say in it, the administration function, just do whatever they want with China. Uh, a bunch of very angry students uh, occupied the parliament such as to put a halt to that particular negotiation and did work. I mean, the <coughs> head of parliament agreed so that we can make a new law that regulates any cross-trade trade agreements or any sort of agreements in the same way, in the same vein as how we negotiate with any other foreign entities. And so after occupying for 22 days and the head of the parliament agreeing to the students' demands, uh, they very peacefully retreated. And um, there were no people dead, very few people in uh, during the, the occupations, one of the most successful occupied movements in uh, human history. <coughs> wow. And did you did you spend time around the legislative one? Mm -hmm. Like, did you? I'm just wondering, sort of the scale. Like, how many mm -hmm. how many people were involved in sort of what the makeup of? Mm -hmm. You said it was the students, but it sounds like it was. Such the, the, a huge number of right. people. The, the, the people inside the parliament were mostly students. Uh, and they were the um, kind of symbolic um, occupiers. Uh, and we, uh, as the logistics suppliers, as the internet live stream suppliers, as the civic tech helpers, we were mostly operating around the streets and also, of course, on the internet. There is a very elaborate system that takes anything everyone says inside and around the parliament and turn it into video live stream and from there into transcripts and from the transcripts a uh, hackpad into either calc which is a, a spreadsheet that correlates it with the logistic um, like uh, supplies they want, they need, and so on, and so that people can supply the exactly right amount of uh, supplies into the occupied area. And in the occupied area, as well as the tents, as well as within the deliberations, all those transcripts are also being correlated and indexed for archival. And also there was a translation team that translated this into about 17 different languages and uh, spread in a social media kind of way. So there, there really is a, a very uh, high profile kind of performative internet kind of uh, way of applied situational application around this whole um, stage uh, of Occupy. And that's the, the main thing that I was uh, helping out uh, during the Occupy. And uh, inside the parliament I spent maybe only a few hours and to just tweet whatever I have seen there. And But mostly I, I just supported the logistics team. And can you tell the story of, because it was right around that time that we first made, mm -hmm. well, that, that yes. you first made contact mm -hmm. with us, yes. can you tell the story of like how, how, you, how you stumbled across them, you know, and, mm -hmm. why, sure. and why you reached out and sort of what, what happened right. from that? So the cable power and radio team, which is the sub-team of uh, the logistics team, that Gov Zero people volunteered to support the, the occupiers. Um, well, what we did was um, have a the occupy area as well as the both streets around it. Uh, we ran very long, redundant uh, CAT6 and then later IP over electricity lines, so that it becomes an intranet comes a land party, so to speak. And then um, we, we also had fiber optic lines that goes just to the street, uh, and it's also the first time in Taiwan history that uh, the telecommunication company actually run a fiber optic line to a occupied area without a street address. Maybe they really craved to see the live streams, too. 
do it themselves. So in any case, uh, we had good extra and intranet uh, communication. Now, physically, that's three different sites, even more. So uh, to how to reach consensus, how to make decisions, becomes a problem. And I'm not personally involved in that, but I heard that uh, Lumia was selected as the uh, way of choice between the uh, field teams and the Occupy Area, the cable power and radio team, to decide for themselves uh, um, issues that must uh, reach consensus. And uh, mostly the communication was done with Telegram and in non-internet covered areas with FireChat. Uh, but Telegram and FireChat, both being like instant message solutions, don't provide ways for people to reach consensus easily. They diverge easily. It's very easy to pull opinions. It's very difficult to reach consensus. So uh, Lumio was introduced to solve very interesting uh, issues like for example, um, there were people, because we're all volunteers, there's no membership, and so um, people can just apply saying they want to help to, to take a shift at maintaining the internet equipment, and then we print a Gov Zero badge uh, to their shoulders, which entitles uh, them, among other things, to walk the, the medical fast, line, fast lane that uh, is reserved to doctors and lawyers and IT people. And so um, there, there are people, because the Gov Zero symbol by itself is public domain, uh, who could just print the badge themselves and, um, you know, walk the faster than me. Um, and there were also people who just uh, show up to volunteer, but it turns out they, they don't know much about IT technologies, they just wanting for the ride or to be associated with Gov Zero. There's uh, people like that. And I'm sure it's a, a, a issue with any Occupy movement, especially long-running ones, like how to deal with people who are just here for party or even like local homeless people and so on, and we ran into those too. So um, the CPR team faced uh, with the problem of how to tell people who are really here for cable power and radio help and people who are just here for a ride but they still show up with a badge. And so uh, there were some really not so good um, options being raised like asking for people's ID cards or uh, have a um, public key trust chain and it's okay if you um, the audience doesn't uh, understand this because it really doesn't work <laughs> and, 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 and so on. Um, so, so there's all sort of lots of good uh, ideas being proposed around and there's time pressure too uh, with on the field. Uh, so Lumia really helped because it led us to try a, a series of straw man proposals and so on and before converging our, our really really good solution. Now it wasn't personally involved in setting up that particular deliberation, uh, I was just an onlooker. But I think um, the CPR team eventually agreed on a, a very simple passcode, uh, which is asking people who show up for the first time out of blue, what is 2 to the power of 16? And if they could answer that with their blinking, they're probably an IT person. And if they're not, then they probably are not. So, so that's how Lumio helped us like converge on a really good and practical on-field solution without requiring uh, multi-factor authentication or any complex technological solutions like that. And you mentioned in your in your blog post that mm -hmm. the, the hand signals uh -huh, yeah. team yes. use use Lumio in some way. Yes. Right, so the hand signals team is uh, the um, deliberative democracy um, corps, so to speak, trained and led by Lu Jianhua, a uh, deliberation uh, expert in Taiwan. And what she did was that she uh, printed out a modified version of the occupied hand signals. And the uh, Occupy Hand Signals, uh, which everybody knows about, is about, um, you know, uh, to talk faster, so that I have to raise a point, uh, that I have a response, and so on. Like, I don't understand what you're talking about, <laughs> and, and, and so on. So, so there's a, um, something being printed. It was uh, designed by uh, the uh, Gov Zero visual designer, E.T. Blue and it was circulated around all the occupied areas, so anybody who just came by for a ride can actually learn about deliberative democracy that deliberates all sorts of different issues concerning the cross-strait trade agreement. 
And so just as the per people inside the parliament were deliberating, uh, people outside on the street, just normal civilian passerbys, are also deliberating. And so there became a, a issue because um, although we're uh, video live casting all the deliberations, there's no way that people can sit through all the deliberations footage because there's so much going on. There's no way that for people to, to just absorb all of it. So it became paramount to just take the whiteboard, uh, the, the summaries, the discussions, what topics were raised and so on, and put them onto somewhere <coughs> that we trust and is not associated with any particular political power in Taiwan who would not censor us. <laughs> and so that uh, the records could be kept somewhere and to be revived. Um, because one of the main demands of the Occupy was were that the, there must be a constitutional co uh, conference or forum that includes all the people in Taiwan be held at some point in the future. So this is not only about the cross trade trade agreement, it's a structural issue caused by a constitution that was made when the current government occupies the entirety of Tai. Uh, tai it wasn't Taiwan at that point, it's just China without Taiwan and Mongolia and Tibet and so on. So it was a constitution designed not for Taiwan, uh, but it was still like brought to Taiwan and so it has all sorts of different issues. So people call for a thorough review on the constitution and because the people who talk about this on the street couldn't um, represent or include everybody in Taiwan, it is very important for them to raise what points need to be discussed but without making a decision. And so which points must be discussed in the follow-up constitutional deliberations were kept as records on Lumio and along with links uh, to the footage and in Google Slides and in other online spaces. So they were mostly for historical archival, but when they were then brought uh, to the second round of constitutional deliberations, which is this year, which is like a year after the Sunflower Movement, they were very uh, instrumental because then people don't have to start from scratch. They can start from the list of things that we know people care about and then do a distributed deliberation on those topics and those topics away. Wow, we had no idea that it was used in that way. Uh -huh. Wow, and the, the translation, mm -hmm. um, the translation is really was really inspiring to mm -hmm. us. Like it was just the fastest translation mm -hmm. we had ever seen over the year. And that was in the very early days when we, I think we hadn't had Transifix up and running for very long mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, would you mind telling just the, the story of, um, I don't know, you, once you found Lumio, you decided that it was useful enough mm -hmm. for the translating, mm -hmm. and if you could just tell the, tell oh, sure. the story of that. Uh, the, right. Um, there is a project, a very long-running project within Gap Zero called the Dawn Democracy or a Dynamic Democracy um, project. And it was um, started by, by CEO Gao and uh, IPA and then ET Blue joined very early on and then uh, Green Party Taiwan and so on. And so uh, the people who are in this project systematically used pretty much every single online consensus making tool that includes ARISs, um, like liquid feedback, uh, all sorts of forks and children's of the liquid feedback systems, um, and um, of course Lumio, and there's a, a lot of other uh, things that they tried. And so uh, and for everything they tried, they, they documented the pros, the cons, like how far along the developments were and whether it's a good fit for which functions and which other functions or not. Uh, also Google Moderator when, when it was still around and so on. So for every open source um, project that the Don Democracy team tried, they also did localization. So I, I joined also very early on, so, so CEO and I did the first Chinese translation of liquid feedback and working with the pirate feedback uh, people after that. So it's kind of a habit that uh, if it's open source, if it's easy to contribute translations, we just swarm over <coughs> it and, and just distribute the translation text among ourselves. And because we, we did that many times, we kind of got good at it because the common vocabularies are, are very much the same across all these different uh, consensus making tools online. So um, Lumio, by, by the time we do Lumio, it, it's 
about the local food sources uh, in time and also because of the Occupy there's also extra attention being paid to, to this kind of online consensus making tool so we also have extra contributors and so that, that was done in a very very quick way. Mm. And how do you, like, as <coughs> someone with your head around mm. basically every open source democracy mm. tool that's mm. ever been used and you've seen the way that, mm. the way that people use, you know, mm. Loom, I've used email and mm. Slack and mm. Facebook and other, like, attempts mm. to, to deliberate and mm. to have meaningful participation and meaningful engagement mm. and how, how do you see where Lumia fits in that ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you sort of see the, I don't know, the unique place that, that something like Lumia occupies? Right. So, um, <coughs> Clay Shirky, uh, one of my heroes, um, has this idea of situational application. Uh, his basic idea is that there really is no one-size-fits-all way in software development and it's always when a situation arises, the best solution are those solutions that could quickly adapt to the situation which changes, like when during an Occupy changes hour by hour. Uh, the requirements change, the kind of consensus that we were able to reach change, the stakeholders change, the places change, the uh, devices where people use the system changes, and, and so on. And so um, there's no way that one single software system can work in both, you know, entirely offline, high bandwidth, online, and live stream, live stream based, uh, you know, projector based. That there's all sorts of ways that software is deployed. So uh, I think the the most important thing that Lumio offers is really that it's open source and it's run by a very agile team that could respond to very ad hoc uh, requests and uh, even not very reasonable demands of uh, functional amendments that, that must respond to the on-field uh, requirements. And it's also because of the architecture of Lumio that we were able to host local instances for people who are without stable links to the internet. It's also very important because otherwise uh, they feel cut out of the decision making process. And so just by a combination of on-site hosting and open source and a agile supporting team, uh, Lumio, however it was designed at that time, was able to evolve generally into the way that we anticipate to be used in the future and also based on all the field demands in the here and now. And I think that's that's the most important thing about Lumio. Um, probably don't have a huge amount of capacity. Yeah, cool. Sorry to stop now. Ah, okay. Oh, good. Yeah, this camera has a habit of stopping. It's, it's, it's we have just a short memory. Stay on the yeah, well, shall we wrap up with... I'd be really keen to... I can, I can I... do this for hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'm thinking about everything we talked about yesterday, which, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which Hannah and Richard and I are still totally buzzing over uh -huh. and we've been talking a lot about after we went yesterday. Um, I mean, Richard put in a request for a question, <laughs> actually, which was really around... Yeah, we have a client. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a request from the audience, <laughs> which is around... Um, he, he was really struck, actually, I mean, all of us were, but really struck by the mm -hmm. approach that GovZero takes and the approach that you articulate in particular mm -hmm. of activism and government. Mm -hmm. So people in activism and people in government mm -hmm. really working in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Or just the type of activism you do yes. seems intensely collaborative mm -hmm. with government. Yes. And it, that doesn't seem like a concession. Mm -hmm. It seems like it, it sort of breaks the revolution reform dichotomy. Exactly. And it's another way of doing things. Exactly. Would you be able to just speak to 
I don't know how you, how you see that as an effective type of activism. Sort of. I'm going to speak to a layperson about that <laughs> without using multi-syllabic words. <laughs> okay, well, I can take a try. Totally. This, this could be, a, uh -huh. we could include this no, as a director's cut for no, uh, the more advanced audience. Okay, right. So, um, so that's not really a question. <laughs> it's an it's observation. A, I think it's an articulation of the theory of change. Uh -huh. Right, right. Um, Okay. So, um, and, and this is all speaking personally because in Gov Zero we, we don't believe in coordinated consensus. Um, I'm probably one of the most intensely collaborative with government person in Gov Zero. Uh, there are people in Gov Zero who intensely collaborate with civic societies, of activist groups of all sorts of kinds, and so on. And actually, the word collaboration um, is an interesting word because if you look at the dictionary definition of collaboration, it means uh, to cooperate on something productive, on something that people can see, something that, that could be realized. And so, before uh, 1940, uh, it was like a almost synonym of cooperation if you look into the Oxford University Dictionary. But after 1940, it takes a different meaning. Uh, it has an extra meaning that says people who co cooperate with the enemy uh, are collaborators. And I think they first started using this sense in the Vichy government in France who worked with occupiers from the Nazi Germany. And we have equivalents here in Asia too. There's this Wang Jingwei equivalent uh, government who was the Nationalist Party, and then but he worked with the Japanese people on the Manchurian uh, territories. And so people don't usually uh, talk kindly to people who, who work uh, across different uh, or even battling lines. Um, but just as we're doing this interview, um, there's a uh, legal thinker in Taiwan who just visited uh, Sunstein, uh, Dr. Um, he was uh, responsible for the idea of deliberative democracy in the government and also about so-called overlapping consensus, like people who don't agree on great ideas can nevertheless uh, agree on practical items. And also he was uh, very instrumental in thinking about ways to, so that we, even though we have bias, we put our bias in a transparent way so that people can see that we come from our upbringings and so on. And, but we can then agree to disagree on those things and then still collaborate. So the point I'm making is that <coughs> being collaborators means, uh, by definition, that my work, that which I abandon my copyright under an open source license, will be used by people who don't like me or I don't like. It's just part of open source. There's no way to say that I'm open source except for people whose opinions I, that I don't share. And also, personally speaking, uh, I was involved with the free software movement uh, before there was an open source movement. And the open source movement kind of emphasized the developer's right to work with each other, while the free software movement worked on the user's right uh, kind of to protect themselves from the overpowering and even increasing power of, free so uh, of the software people. So these two movements don't share an ideology. They are ideologically almost opposites. But Richard Stallman, the uh, founder of the Free Software Movement, said, you know, the great thing about people with different ideologies is that on practical matters, we still do more or less exactly the same thing. We, we, we still work together, we still collaborate. That is in opposed to some other activist groups who share the same ideology nominally, but practice it in opposite ways so that they could never work together. And so this is how, how I was brought up as a child and then as a teenager, in that we, if we just put the grand narratives in a way that's public, transparent, but don't let that dictate our behaviors, we could nevertheless agree on practical things that everybody benefits from. 
And so I think this also informs my choice as using you know, open source as a way to deliver my work in Cup Zero, because then people from the government, from all sorts of level of units, from organizations, when they use those work, they stopped being representatives from their units, from their organization. They, they become human beings. They become collaborators into this software project, into this new kind of communication. And when they participate in this capacity, they also de-alienate a little bit of themselves from the organization. So it's also liberatory for them too. So I think that's, that's where I'm coming from. It's just a way for people to relate to each other as authentic uh, human beings with the help from internet mediated tools so that people can for a while during their work time not to think themselves as representing any particular organization's interests but just responding to the here and now that they see from this online community. That's beautiful. I think it was really clear. <laughs> There's still a lot of multisyllabic words. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. Yeah. And in terms of working directly uh -huh. with I'm just really mm -hmm. curious about your experience of working with people directly in government mm -hmm. because we, because um, it sounded, mm -hmm. it sounded very positive, mm -hmm. just, like when we spoke yesterday, it yeah, sounded yeah. like there's been huge progress yeah. and that the mindset of the people in government you're mm -hmm. working with yeah. is, is really similar, it's yeah, really shared. Exactly. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you sort of speak a little to that, to the sort of the desire for change that you mm -hmm. see among the people inside? Sure. Okay. Right. So, um, because when, when I participate in any this kind of joint project, um, and this is a Gov Zero <coughs> standard, uh, in that we ask them, what kind of Creative Commons license do you want for all the products, for all the efforts, of all the fruit of this particular collaboration? Um, for Gov Zero, it's really like a research lab in that we seek all sorts of ways to solve uh, societal problems. And so, as any research, the most majority fails because they're experiments. But because it's meticulously documented how it fails, and that every product along the way was open source, was creative commons, other attempts can build upon it. It's just the basic scientific model. And just by how people in the government or in a profit, uh, for-profit organization respond to this very simple question, what kind of Creative Commons license would you like to choose for your work? We know where they're coming from. If they say, you know, no derivatives, then we know that they're after power, after